I'm going to talk about climate change and extreme events, uh, which is one of the main areas of uh, my research group, um, probably the main area these days. And I'm going to start out by telling you two things that are true, just to get us so we're all on the same page, and then we'll see where it goes with the Q&A. So um, it is a fact, an empirical fact, based on historical data, that the audience from which I am most likely to get the most climate denial questions and comments is a Stanford alumni audience. <laughs> I'm not, that's not a joke. This is a fact. I've been on campus, off campus. It, it's the highest probability. And the last couple talks I've given to um, Stanford alumni groups, uh, afterwards people have said, geez, it seemed like you really, really spent a lot of time trying to convince us that global warming is real. I don't think you need to do that. So those are both true. And what I'm going to do today is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, give you a little bit of a primer on how the climate system works, but I'm not going to try to convince you that global warming is real. We are experiencing increasing frequency and intensity of extreme events. These events are causing uh, greater damage. Um, and uh, I certainly get a lot of questions about uh, whether or not there's a connection between global warming and, and any of these events. And I started my PhD back in September of 2000, so 21 years ago. And back then, if um, you saw a scientist uh, answer a question in public about global warming and extreme events, uh, you would get some version of, we don't do that. Right? Some version of, well, you're talking about weather, we're talking about climate, or uh, climate's what you expect, weather's what you get, or something like that. And now, uh, what we're seeing is uh, you know, something on the right. This is an actual quote. I'm not going to keep it up for too long, because I don't want anyone to Google and find out who said it. But this is an actual quote. And this is true. This, this is a fact. <laughs> it is definitely between 0 and 100%. There is no, no question about it. Indisputable. Uh, whether or not that's useful is a little less clear. So uh, what uh, I and my uh, graduate students and postdocs have been working on, collaborators, is if we can answer this question in a more systematic way that's uh, tractable scientifically, like posing hypotheses that are testable hypotheses and then evaluating those hypotheses rigorously with uncertainty, quantifying the uncertainty. Uh, and this risk framing really enables us to do that. So I'm going to talk today mostly about the hazard part of this and how we uh, go about testing hypotheses about the connection between global warming and uh, individual extreme events in terms of the hazard like the heat wave and the flood and the, and the uh, severe thunderstorm, et cetera. Uh, but this is also much more practically actionable. And there are real decisions that are being made, uh, including lawsuits um, and other decisions about, you know, that really depend on the answer to this question. Uh, and and I'll, I'll touch a little bit on where exposure and vulnerability come in, but um, mostly I'll focus on the, on the hazards. Okay, so quick primer. Uh, we are lucky, point number one is we are lucky that we have a greenhouse effect. Uh, without greenhouse gases, uh, Earth would be a frozen ball of ice. Uh, we went through in my uh, Frosh intro sem this morning, we went through uh, the energy balance for the planet and proved that uh, Earth would be have a surface temperature of 18 degrees Celsius below freezing uh, without a greenhouse effect. So this is a you know, pretty simple ball and stick model. You can prove that the greenhouse effect is helping us have a life, you know, wa liquid water-based life on Earth. Essentially, most of the energy from the sun, that high-frequency shortwave radiation, is not absorbed by the atmosphere. And a large fraction of the lower frequency radiation that's emitted by the Earth is absorbed by the atmosphere. So this is really good uh, that uh, we have this greenhouse effect. 
And the higher the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the stronger that greenhouse effect is going to be. And just the simple physics of planet Earth dictate that uh, if the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere increase, the, that's going to increase the energy going into the climate system. It's going to cause uh, the global temperature to increase, and it's going to cause the radiation budget of the planet to change. And we are, in fact, yeah, increasing the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. So this is the famous Keeling curve. And you can see there's a very regular uh, oscillation in the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, due to the biosphere, uh, photosynthesis and respiration. Uh, and in addition, uh, much larger than that noise is a very clear signal of increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. You may have heard that uh, greenhouse gas emissions, including carbon dioxide emissions, were reduced uh, during COVID. Anyone know how much? Uh, about 7% for CO2 for the year. It, it was about 15% initially. That's correct. So the daily emissions during like April of 2020, March, April of 2020, were about 17% uh, lower. So yeah, about 15%. And for the year in 2020, it was about uh, a a uh, seven percent decrease, and uh, can you see it in the atmospheric concentrations? No, not so much. Up they went, and that makes sense. Emissions in 2020 were about like they were in 2013, right? Uh, if you go, you know, we, we still emitted, you know, 34 billion tons or so of of uh, carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. About half of that is staying in the atmosphere quarter going into the oceans, quarter going into the land, CO2 concentrations are going up. So you already know from what I showed you about the greenhouse effect and Earth's energy balance that this is going to increase the energy input to the climate system. And it's going to cause global warming. That is exactly what's occurring. So we are now up above one degree Celsius of global warming uh, over the industrial era, which you see on the right. Uh, this is unprecedented at least in the last 2,000 years. It's in terms of the rate of change, uh, uh, you know, a degree in a century, uh, it's, it's unprecedented uh, since the last glacial period and most likely in the last uh, you know, three or four million years. Um, this is uh, from the recent IPCC report, uh, the IPCC's assessment of uh, large scale changes in the climate system and where they fall within. Uh, a longer-term perspective. So, you know, our CO2 concentration highest in the last two million years, uh, sea level rise uh, increasing at the fastest rate in the last 3,000 years. Arctic sea ice is now in a completely different regime, statistically an entirely different regime than when I was born. Literally the, the highest summer sea ice, the greatest summer sea ice concentration now is lower than uh, the lowest sea ice concentration was in the, in the era that I was born in, in the 70s. Um, and it's at its lowest level in the last millennium. And we're seeing a, around the world glaciers retreat uh, at the fastest rate in at least the last 2,000 years. Uh, in terms of extreme events, uh, you know, we can come up with a pretty simple hypothesis right here um, in this large room uh, just on our own, right? Like if all else being equal, if everything warms by a degree Celsius, then we ought to be getting more hot events, right? It's with no, not, without invoking any other changes, um, no changes in variability, no changes in climate dynamics, just simple shift of the mean, we would expect more, uh, more hot events, for example, uh, as you see in this cartoon. And a lot of my research is focused on, uh, you know, is it this simple or not? And not just for temperature, but for other kinds of extreme events. And the reason that this is uh, important uh, is that we are um, being impacted by uh, increasing extremes. Uh, this is just one example, um, but these are the billion-dollar uh, weather disasters in recent years. We've, we, uh, this is an older graphic. We actually have had uh, even more in recent years. Um, but we are paying out more and more as a society uh, each year. Uh, and uh, this is just financial costs, right? And there are a lot of other impacts for people and communities and ecosystems in addition to the financial costs. So we know um, 
just from looking at historic, historical observations, from analyzing historical observations, that many kinds of extremes are increasing overall. Uh, severe heat's increasing, heavy rainfall, uh, extreme storm surge flooding. Right? So when storms make landfall, uh, the flooding that occurs uh, as a result of the sea level rise that's already happened, that, that uh, flooding is increasing. Uh, there's also been a huge explosion in research into individual extreme events, right? So not just the long-term trends in daily maximum temperature, the long-term trends in precipitation intensity, but individual events that have happened in a particular place at a particular time with a particular characteristic causing particular impacts. Um, this was not, this, this was what, when I was in, in doing my PhD, what scientists said, we don't do that. And starting with a seminal paper in 2004, uh, analyzing the 2003 European heat wave. Uh, that really unlocked this area of research. And now there are you know, hundreds of scientists around the world trying to answer this question. There are a lot of examples of individual events that have been analyzed. Uh, and uh, I am going to take you through a little bit of a story of uh, my research group's work on this and uh, where we started and where we've ended up. So um, my work on this uh, kind of accelerated in the last California drought. That last California drought lasted for a long time. There were lots of papers published during the last California drought. My group published, I think, four papers, three or four papers during the last, about the, about the California drought while the drought was still going on. Now we're back in another drought, uh, and it, it, a lot sooner than we, than, uh, we probably would have liked. Um, so... How many of you are, how many of you have ever been to California? Um, how many of you are from California, live in California, have are been experiencing the drought? Okay, you know all about it. All right. Uh, how many of you have reduced your water use by 15%? Awesome. All right. I, I actually, what that was, a, I didn't know people had. Um, yeah, so there's the, up on the top right, that's our current drought. Um, over on the left are some statistics about the last drought. And... Uh, in, in a lot of ways, the current drought's actually been more severe. Uh, you know, I think the 12-month the, the precipitation uh, was that we just, for the last 12-month period before, before these storms, um, was, you know, historically low. Uh, so we've been in a, and of course, the reservoirs are at historically low. Many, many reservoirs are at historically low levels. So we're, we're in another really severe drought. It's nice that we're getting these atmospheric rivers, but they are not going to get us out of this drought. Um, and one thing I want to say, I, I made a, you know, a little, little tongue-in-cheek asking about your 15% water use reduction, but California has actually been very proactive, and I think in my experience has been very proactive in engaging with the research community, uh, scientists, engineers, uh, other scholars, legal scholars, um, and really making decisions in real time that are informed by the latest research. I think that was the case in my, my first-hand experience, that was the case in the last drought, and it's been, been the case in this drought. Something that's interesting about that 15% reduction that we've all been asked to voluntarily take is that we had, uh, you know, there was a, in the last drought, there was the governor's uh, order, right, that that uh, we had to reduce 25% statewide. And actually a good chunk of that stuck. So about 16% uh, of that stuck, right? So we were, when, this, when, when, the, when the governor requested the voluntary 15%, we were down about 16% from where the last drought started in terms of statewide water use. So, so that's the good news. The tough news is that there, you know, it's, we're getting more efficient, so it's, there's less to, less to cut without, um, without conflict and inconvenience. So, okay, so that's my little bit of support for the state of California. Uh, so we started looking at California drought during the last drought, and um, I'll, this, is, this is old research now, but I wanna give you a little bit of a flavor of kind of the, just the first order approach here. So uh, this is a nice figure. This is the figure that the Chronicle made of figure one from our paper, and they're, they're uh, way better at graphics than we are. Um, I'll note, we include, we include vertical axes in our figures, but they don't. So uh, you can't tell what the units are, sorry. Um, 
But what you can tell is that the red line's going up, right? California's been warming. Does the pointer work? I, I, I don't know if I dare try. Oh, there it is, faint. Okay, yeah. So there, California's been warming, actually pretty similar um, to the global mean. There's actually no long-term reduction in mean annual uh, precipitation, uh, which caused a, a number of people at the beginning of the last drought to say, well, well climate change can't be playing a role because the long-term mean annual precipitation hasn't changed. But it turns out uh, that it's really the combination of low precipitation and high temperature that exacerbates drought risk. And we see on the right that when we look at the drought metrics uh, from, say, the US government, actually, um, the frequency of drought years actually has been increasing. So if we just look at all the years, again, this is, this is for the last drought, but if we look at all the years in the California climate record up until 2014, um, we, we had a couple big findings in this paper. The first one, we looked at all, like more than a century of data. We didn't find a single drought that was a wet year. I know, it was big. The, re the reviewers were like, publish this now. Get this, get this in print now. Yeah, so, we, so none of the years with droughts actually uh, had higher than average precipitation. In fact, they all had lower than average precipitation. But interestingly, all the severe droughts actually had uh, at least uh, half a standard deviation negative precipitation only. So this is actually important. Drought, uh, droughts require a deficit of precipitation. Big news. But here's the thing. There are plenty of uh, low precipitation years in the California climate record that did not produce drought. Okay? And in fact, one of those low precipitation years that is also warm is more than twice as likely to end up producing drought as a low precipitation year that's cool. Okay? And some people, when I present this, say, well, hmm, that's interesting. I've lived in California for 20 years, and all the low precipitation years have been warm. Who's lived in California for 20 years? All right, you're right. All the low precipitation years have been warm. That's because of long-term warming, it turns out. Okay, so California is now in a climate. This was, you know, this paper is from 2015. We're now, you know, if I made this plot for the last 20 years now, we'd be, these uh, cool, cool years would be disappearing. We're, we're pretty much getting every single year a warmer year than, than the 20th century average. And what that means is that now we're in a climate where uh, low precipitation years are much more likely to coincide with high temperature, right? Twice as likely, in fact. Uh, the odds that low precipitation years uh, turn into drought have doubled, and the total frequency of drought years overall has doubled. Okay. And this is basically just like, just think about flipping two coins. We used to have uh, two coins. Each was coming up tails half the time, and they'd, we'd get two tails a quarter of the time. We're now getting a, uh, a temperature coin that's warm, 80, 90, maybe, maybe we're on the cusp of 100% of the time, right? So if you've got one coin that's coming up tails every time, you don't need any change in precipitation to, to still get uh, an increase in that combination of warm uh, and dry. So I'll spare you the boring details of the figure on the right, but we have very clear physical understanding, very high statistical confidence that the long-term warming of California and the increase in the odds that low precipitation coincides with high temperature, we have very high confidence that that would not have occurred, that would have been much less likely to occur, uh, without global warming. Okay, so we did that for the California drought. We did that for uh, the last California drought. I haven't bothered to do it for this one, actually. Um, we did, it for, we did it for a number of different extreme events in different parts of the world, and that got, I mean, that was exciting, but, um, but we started to wonder, do we have to like, go and do this everywhere, every time there's an event, uh, or wherever the event happens, or could we just do this in advance everywhere, right? Everywhere's had a record hot event, everywhere's had a record wet event. Could we just go around the world and ask this question in advance, basically? 
So that's what we did in this paper. And uh, what we found is that um, global warming is, in fact, already influencing record setting events around the world. So this is an example um, for uh, the extreme hot events. So everywhere that's not blue, uh, we have uh, confidence that global warming has increased the odds of a new record high temperature. This is one of my greatest achievements professionally is this color bar. And I really, I, for this, this hot pink color, does this look hot pink to you? Yeah, no, yes, no, okay. All right, that's the first question. So what I was really going for was the color of my shirt, but we have an ongoing debate in my house. Yeah, I'm hearing the groans. So raise your hand if you think my shirt is hot pink. Okay, raise your hand if you think it's like some kind of purple. This is unbelievable to me. My whole family, they're so mad at me. I think that this shirt is hot pink. Like I, it's, I don't know what is wrong with my eyes. I was trying to match this shirt with the color bar. Anyway, you all are right. My, my, uh, my, my wife and all three kids agree with you. I, I, I need, yes, they'd like me to go to the doctor as well. Um, okay, so if we add all this up, uh, we're already in a climate where uh, the odds of record-setting hot events have increased already at more than 80% of the globe. And if we do that same analysis for record wet and record dry events, it's about half of the globe. That's for unprecedented events. That's not like, oh, it's hot, it's hot. It's like that's hotter than it's ever been. OK, so that's just for temperature. Um, you can tell I'm really into just simple counting exercises. So we can go around the world and ask, uh, what about this hot dry combination that we found for the California drought? If we just go around the world and ask hot temperature, low precipitation, uh, what do we find? And in fact, that's increased globally as well. Not, not at every location around the globe, but, uh, but we have uh, high confidence that, um, oh, where is the pointer? Okay, yeah, that, uh, that increase would not have occurred uh, without human forcing and uh, is consistent with, uh, with the response to human forcing. And what this means is that different regions of the globe are more likely to experience hot and dry conditions simultaneously. And both in a given region and at the same time uh, uh, at two different regions, two different far-flung regions, such as, for example, the western U.S. Uh, and, and uh, Australia, where you may remember uh, in 2019 we had a very late wildfire year in, in California in 2019 that overlapped with the start of the wildfire year in Australia, and the global uh, firefighting apparatus uh, simply was overextended, All right? So there's a, there's a limited number of aircraft that are equipped to fight fires uh, in the world, and they actually move between the northern and southern hemisphere. And 2019 was an unfortunate example where uh, having the Kincaid fire really late in the year here in California, an early start in Australia, uh, that, that system got pinched. So what I'm going to talk about next is uh, what we know about uh, wildfire, and in particular here in California. So this is the August complex from last year, the million plus acre fire up in Northern California. And you'll see different statistics about, um, about uh, area burned and other wildfire uh, characteristics. Uh, here, according to this figure uh, from Duffy et al., um, which I was a co-author, um, the linear trend is about a tenfold increase in forested area burned in the western U.S. Uh, over the last four decades or so. Other work by uh, John Abitsoglu and Park Williams, uh, Park made this figure on the left, um, their work shows that if we, when they, uh, when they calculate the contribution of long-term warming to the area burned, they find about half 
of the area burned in the last four decades has been contributed by long-term warming. And it's mostly through the effect of high temperature on vegetation aridity, right? So the, the moisture deficit in the atmosphere, the vapor pressure deficit, to use the jargon, um, has been increasing. And that's drying out vegetation. And about half of the increase in area burned over the course of, over the, over the region, the western US, has been contributed by long-term warming. Here in California, as you know, uh, we have been uh, quite, uh, quite impacted by recent fires. So here are some statistics. I mean, it, it's, it's pretty phenomenal uh, what we've been experiencing in recent years. Uh, we, since 2017, I think every fall quarter, we, you know, teaching here on campus fall quarter, every fall quarter up until this one, we've had a smoke event on campus. Um, so we went five, five years in a row. I, I, you know, I'm pretty confident these two atmospheric rivers are going to get us out of the proverbial woods on that. But this has been, um, we're lucky. I mean, we're just getting the smoke. But uh, obviously, those who, whose homes have been destroyed and who've been displaced are, you know, have uh, been impacted much worse. But this is a, this is a region-wide challenge. So we had a paper actually that came out, was published the week of those lightning fires last year, like literally the same week as those lightning complex fires last year, this paper came out. So we were focused on the autumn wildfire conditions uh, because of this, uh, th this, these recent fires during the autumn season where uh, we had large fires burning, again, as I mentioned, overlapping with the fires in Australia and also overlapping northern and southern California. So uh, the first, our, our first question was, what's the relationship between extreme wildfire weather conditions during the autumn season and the area burned in California? So when we look back at uh, the historical record, we find that uh, the years with a high number of extreme wildfire weather days, so high winds, low humidity, uh, high temperature, low precipitation preceding uh, the event. The years that have a high number of those extreme wildfire weather days have contributed a uh, much larger area burned on average uh, than, than the years that don't have those extreme wildfire weather days. And you may not be surprised to know, as people who spend time in California, that uh, the frequency of those, uh, of those days has been increasing. So over the last four decades, the frequency of uh, days with extreme wildfire weather conditions has more than doubled during the autumn season statewide in California. So we can look at that spatially. So here's, um, here's uh, the climate we're in now, uh, this current period. We haven't gotten to 2035 yet. Don't worry, it's still 2021. But if we look at the, the period we're in now, the probability of these extreme wildfire weather days uh, compared to uh, earlier in the 20th century when our uh, wildfire uh, preparation and response system was designed and built. Uh, we can see already uh, that, that statewide uh, trend that I showed you. You can see that already reflected in these areas that have high wildfire weather risk. And if we look out in the future, um, yeah, it's getting redder already. Uh, yeah, so this is, you may have heard of the Paris Agreement. Who's heard of the Paris Agreement? Okay, Paris Agreement, though, governments of the world agree to hold global warming below 2 degrees, pursue 1.5, and have made commitments consistent with 2.7, more or less, something like that. Okay, it all could change in Glasgow, who knows? Um, yeah, so if we look at that Paris window, 1.5 to 3 degrees, you can see uh, even if the Paris Agreement is successful, we're still going to be getting more of what we've been dealing with in terms of the, the climate conditions that are contributing to these wildfire events. Now, if you would like a really uh, brightly colored future, uh, we, if we get past 3 degrees, Right, that's on the far right, and this is double, doubling and some, some places a tripling of the frequency of occurrence of these high-risk days. 
So uh, I think the main message with, with this wildfire uh, result and with a lot of different impacts uh, where, where extreme events matter for impacts is that uh, the more global warming we get, the greater the impacts we'll be facing. And if we're able to reduce the trajectory of global warming, that, that will reduce the impacts, but won't, will still uh, leave us with more climate change than we've already had, uh, more intensification of extremes than we've already had. So we've been uh, conducting these kinds of analyses for different uh, areas where, where uh, people and ecosystems are vulnerable. So I'm going to show you two more uh, results real quick from just from the last few months. Um, and these are both, uh, one of the questions I've been asking, and, 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 and this has mostly been in collaboration with Marshall Burke, who's, um, who's an uh, economist here at Stanford, and also Francis Davenport, who's a PhD student, um, very, uh, very uh, successful uh, and impressive PhD student. Um, we've been working on trying to quantify the financial costs with, uh, associated with these kinds of events. So just a couple of examples. First uh, paper that we um, published uh, earlier this summer, so this came out in July. So what we're doing here is we're asking, we look back at the history of the US crop insurance program. Right, so you and me and everyone else that's a taxpayer, right? we're, we're uh, supporting the US crop insurance program. And uh, the US, uh, Department of Agriculture keeps records at the county level of all of the claims going back decades. Right? So if we look back at the climate conditions in each year in each county and the, the, the financial losses, the indemnities paid in, in each county in each year, uh, and then use uh, you know, Marshall's, um, Marshall's and, and, and Francis's uh, empirical techniques, the econometric techniques for quantifying uh, causality, uh, we find a very steep uh, relationship with both extreme precipitation and uh, extreme temperature. And then if we just ask if the warming in each county hadn't happened, what would the indemnities have been given that empirical relationship? So what you see on the left here are the actual indemnities paid in 2012, right? So you may remember 2012, it was very hot, very dry. Uh, more than $18 billion in, uh, in indemnities paid. Uh, this was the single largest year in the indemnities program, the crop insurance program. And then on the right is our calculation of uh, what fraction in each county, what fraction of the indemnities were contributed by the trend in temperature, so the warming, the long-term warming. And overall, this was almost half, right? Almost half of the... $18 billion in 2012 were contributed by long-term warming. And at the, at the individual county level, we see even higher, 50, even 60 plus percent uh, of the indemnities contributed. So these are, these are real costs uh, that we are incurring from climate change. A paper from Francis's dissertation uh, published in January uh, uh, conducted a very similar analysis. So Francis did it first. Um, and this was uh, doing similar analysis of uh, precipitation variability and flood damages in the US. And what Francis finds is that uh, over the last three decades, about a third of the financial losses from flooding in the US have been contributed by changing precipitation, primarily intensification of the most extreme precipitation events, which uh, Francis goes on to show in the paper, and it's consistent with previous research uh, very consistent with what we expect uh, from global warming. Just for thermodynamic, just the causes clapper on effects. So the point being, we're already, we're, we're paying out a lot of money for these events. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier, that's, that's just the financial costs, uh, never mind the, the uh, non-financial costs. Okay, so the last time I gave a talk in Semex Auditorium was 2014, and I gave a TED talk, a Stanford TEDx talk. It's very exciting. And it's so important. TEDx is so important. 
Um, I don't want to suggest that reunion and homecoming is not important, but TEDx is so important that they have the speakers meet with a consultant. Okay, so I got a very clear message from the consultant. You have to say there's hope. So I made this slide. <laughs> so I made this slide for my TED talk the last time I spoke in Semex, and here, Semex, and here it is. There is hope, and it's got an exclamation mark which means there's really hope. Okay, there is hope. Because Stanford has announced a new school focused on climate and sustainability that will s amplify Stanford's impact. President Mark Tessier Levine announced it last May of 2020. Uh, it now has its own logo, temporary logo, uh, I, I'm certain, I'm certain um, it will, we'll, we'll know at some point what it's called. It's going to be exciting. Uh, I'll let you know. I'm sure the website will update the logo. Uh, but this is, this is just, this is so exciting, right? Um, in all seriousness, this is, so I've been spending a lot of my time on this in the last 22 months. Um, and I think this is really monumental for for Stanford, and, and uh, I don't need to tell you, Stanford is very important for the whole world. So um, this is important for the world. So uh, I think this is uh, Stanford saying that, um, you know, just as medicine and business and law and, and engineering and education and humanities and sciences uh, are important, climate and sustainability is important. It's important on the century timescale. So it's a very exciting time. Um, you'll be hearing more soon, not only about the name, I'm sure, but also there's a dean search going on, so we'll be hearing who the inaugural dean will be, and uh, I'm, it makes me very excited to be here at Stanford. It's a great time, and I think the, the coming years are going to be even better uh, for, for our students um, and for our alumni. 